Greetings and welcome to the Technicolor Dojo. I'm your host, Joshua Tiberius, and today we're going to look at an unlikely favorite of mine. It's not unusual for an American audience to have never heard of an Eastern franchise. However, it is uncanny when one of those franchises started off in the States, but gained much more traction in the land of the rising sun. Such is the case of Rascal the Raccoon. Rascal, a memoir of a better era, is a best-selling autobiographical children's book by Wisconsin native Sterling North. North is a remarkable man who has unfortunately been all but forgotten. Born in 1906 as the youngest of three children, he lost his mother at an early age. By the time he was 15, he had contracted and beaten a severe polio infection, but was told he would never walk again. Being an excellent craftsman, and disliking that kind of talk, the young North built a collection of elaborate exercise machines that he utilized to regain the use of his legs. He was well versed in biology, both zoology and botany, was a dedicated husband and father, as well as professional children's author and literary critic. He was legitimately well known in his time, but died well before the contemporary era. Rascal is his best known work. Released in 1964, it won the prestigious Newbery Medal for Children's Literature. It's a prose poem that deals with a year in Sterling's life as an adolescent, years before his polio infection, particularly the year where he finds a baby raccoon he names Rascal. I haven't read the book in its entirety, but I did read some of it, and the story is of a young boy, a loner dealing with the loss of his mother, as well as isolation from his family, and how raising a baby raccoon helped him deal with his tragedies. Translated into many languages, Rascal enjoyed much success in its era and was even made into a shitty Disney movie of the same name starring Bill Mummy, that kid from Lost in Space. If you were to look at an Amerocentric timeline of pop culture, that's it. Rascal never really got any bigger in the 70s and was almost entirely forgotten by the 80s. However, that's only in America. 1975, Japan. The newly formed, but veteran staffed Nippon Animation Company takes control of the Kalpas Children's Theater, a time slot on Fuji TV dedicated to adapting Western literature for the anime medium. Nippon adapted Rascal into Aragoma Rascal, a full single series anime that ran for the standard 52 episodes between January and December of 1977. It was a huge hit. And why wouldn't it be? There were some real heavy hitters working for Nippon at the time. This list includes Hayao Miyazaki, Miyazaki himself directed nearly half of the anime's episodes. And for those unequated, I'll just say that Miyazaki is known as the Walt Disney of Japan and leave it at that. Rascal was such a huge hit that its legacy is still seen to date. The raccoon is the mascot for several major corporations. In fact, due to the success of the anime over the last 35 years, an estimated 50,000 raccoons have been bought as pets. The anime never made it to the States unlike some other World Masterpiece Theater shows. Many speculate this is due to Disney holding the copyrights to Rascal and being the general cocksuckers they are about it. I wouldn't hold my breath that we ever get an English translation of the show as I've seen a few eps and let's just say anime has moved past that style, even though it is quite classic. <laughs> okay, okay, I know what you're thinking. Enough about the franchise, let's talk about the fucking game. Aragoma Rascal was developed by J-Force and published by J-Force is a short-lived Japanese developer that never made anything that got to the States. While Masao may be best known for the Rama one half fighting game and Cybernator on the SNES, and maybe Target Earth on the Sega Genesis, though they only published those in Japan and Western parties published them in America, but anyway, Masao was also a brand of sorts for Nippon Computer Systems, Nippon's Animation Digital Market Division. Admittedly, the game has little to do with the story. Created out of basically one scene from the source material where Rascal gets into some jars of the local general store. Rascal Raccoon is a single screen match 3 puzzle platformer. Though it's much different than most Busta Move and Tetris clones because instead of directly manipulating the puzzle pieces, you use a character within the puzzle to do so. This is a mechanic not often used but is famously shared with Wario's Woods where the player controls total screen to manipulate the game pieces as well. 
Though the Nintendo offering came out in February of 94 and Rascal came out in June, I still don't believe as some do that this game is a ripoff of the mainstream title. Rascal simply has too much polish for me to believe that it was developed in only four months. But I could be wrong. Actually, I feel like both games draw inspiration from some game that I didn't come across in my research. In the single player game, you control Rascal and stack three light jars either horizontally or vertically to make them disappear and raise the green bar at the bottom of the screen. Once this bar fills up, a diamond tile will drop and if it hits a stack of two or more light jars, it clears the screen, allowing Rascal to move on to the next level. As the player progresses, the game adds more jars at a quicker pace as well as an unclearable tile in the form of a wooden crate. You have to learn box management because these also block combos from forming. There are 12 stages, each is faster, adds more sets of jars, and gives you more box drops than the previous. However, you can adjust difficulty to not add the different types of jars, or have them present for the first level for a larger challenge. The game's a bit on the easy side, which is a plus because this is a game made for children. However, it's also dreadfully slow on early stages, but you can always bump up your level before you start if you want a quicker game. There are three multiplayer modes where the second player takes control of Sterling. The first is a competitive co-op where both players share the same playfield. The second is similar to the first except it's presented in full screen and each player has their own playfield to work with. The final mode is a race mode that reminds me a little bit of the split screen in Sonic 2 for Sega Genesis. In this mode, the players are presented with an obstacle course and the first to cross the finish line wins. The controls are snappy and precise. While using the D-pad to control Rascal around the screen, he automatically climbs low stacks for ease of movement, but sometimes you must jump with the up button or the A button. I actually prefer to using the up to jump because it works well with the precise nature of the control scheme paired with Rascal's climbing. Use the B button to grab a jar and tap it again to release it in the spot you like. You can release jars while jumping as well, kind of throwing them into position. And every once in a while, it's prudent to push the jars. The graphics are cheerful and colorful, making great use of the palette. Everything is bright, well outlined, and handsomely drawn. While the animations are good, they're not great. Rascal is usually depicted in one of his famous poses, while Sterling has been chibi-sized for this. I'm on the record as someone who does not appreciate cutesy art styles, the kind you'd see in Yoshi's Island and the like. However, the reason I think I give this a pass is because it isn't necessarily trying to be cutesy. It just naturally is. It feels right for the style. I particularly like the backgrounds. 12. One for every single player stage, mimicking the months of the year. Each brings to life a setting from the anime and are painstakingly rendered with a lot of accuracy to both the original television work while also conveying the sense of pastoral tranquility that North was trying to achieve in the original book. One downside is that these portions of the artwork are often covered up by the game's tiles. Also disappointing is that the action only takes up a third of the screen as most of the visual representation during the gameplay is made up of the information overlay. The sound effects are appropriate, though I can assume that some might find Rascal Squeaks annoying. The music, however, is something else entirely. The tunes range from upbeat to relaxing and will make you tap a toe or even break out a small grin. I can sum it up by saying it's not the video game music you're used to. There are many synthesized instruments such as banjo and tuba that you just don't hear that often in the States. This is because much like the graphical presentation, it's a love letter to the anime. For a short representation of those two points, watch the intros back to back. So, aside from being an astonishingly roundabout way to adapt a forgotten book into a puzzle game, what makes Rascal relevant to a 30-year-old American living outside its intended time, culture, and demographic? While it does provide the dulcet tones and relaxed gameplay necessary to ease the rigors of a hectic day, that's not what makes it special. While it's impossible for me to feel nostalgic while playing Rascal, something strange happens when I do so. 
I can honestly remember what it's like experiencing video games for the first time because it's familiar but also not quite like anything previously seen. I can imagine myself as a 10 year old sitting cross legged on the floor on Saturday morning and playing some video games without a care in the world. And it's things like that that can't be measured in hours or days or minutes or seconds, but in moments. But there is one final interesting tidbit I'd like to share before you go. One of the first video games I can ever remember was Frogger. It may not be the first, but it's close. It sat in the corner of the local pizza parlor, Johnny's. Well, I used to stare at that machine and it fascinated me, and every once in a while someone would let me stand on a stool and play it. Well, I think the rest is history. But it's more than just personal history. If you listen closely to the stage theme for Frogger, you'll notice an amazing link between Frogger and Rascal. That's right. The guys who programmed Frogger also used the iconic Rascal Raccoon theme in their own game. So in his own way, Rascal has always been a part of American video gaming history. Thanks for watching. Cut, print, and whatever. You broke something.